Jen McCabe, the wife of Matt McCabe, receives a phone call from the defendant, Karen Reed. He goes on to describe that the defendant was screaming uh, on the other line, not knowing where John was, and that the last time she saw him was at the bar. Take a look. With respect to uh, the defendant's statement, the last time she saw uh, the, Mr. O'Keefe was at the waterfall, uh, what, if anything, uh, what if anything occurred to you in reference to that? In reference to her saying she last saw him at the waterfall, I then told my wife, what are you talking about? So I was, that was not what you said, sir, but I think Mr. Riley asked you what you thought, what you gathered from that. I thought she was crazy. And why was that? Because I saw her vehicle. I saw the black SUV arrive to the um, 34 via, via view that morning. Following those phone conversations, uh, what, if any other conversations did she have with the defendant that morning? Um, there were multiple calls. I don't recall what calls were made, what time, but the next call, we were informing the defendant that, wait, we saw your car. We saw you come to 34 Fairview. You, you guys were there. And I heard the response of, I don't remember. I don't remember going there. What, if any other conversation, do you recall any of those subsequent phone conversations that you overheard from the at um, some moment, um, as I said, my wife had made a couple phone calls. In one of the calls with Karen Reed, she blurted that she broke her taillight, cracked her taillight, something to that effect, while we were, um, while Jen and I were still in the bedroom and she was on the phone. What is the next thing that you remember occurring that morning? Um, while I was getting dressed, I put my jeans on. My wife went downstairs. She was going to make a coffee. Uh, my wife and I were proceeding to leave. We were going to leave our house and um, make a drive to the house of the gentleman that my wife was calling that we possibly thought uh, John could have met up with. Um, and within that moment, again, I don't know the exact time, I then heard um, yelling out in my front yard. And when you heard the yelling in your front yard, <laughs> I realized it was uh, Karen Reed, and I told my wife to please tell her to shut up. She's going to wake up the whole neighborhood. So remember, Karen Reed wakes up, can't find John O'Keefe, goes back to the house, and she's freaking out because she does then find him uh, in the snowbank there. Uh, still with me this hour is attorney Catherine Lizardo, and joining the uh, firm here in the studio is criminal defense attorney and former assistant uh, prosecutor Michael Corbanich. So, Mike. Tell me, um, you know, this is Boston at its finest. I mean, uh, the, I see so much social media about, you know, uh, the, the, the accents and the personalities and this seemingly uh, kind of drinking lifestyle. Not that there's anything wrong with it, uh, but, but it's certainly a factor in the case. How, how does this factor in your mind into this case against this woman? That's a, it's a very difficult factor because you, not only does it question the defendant here, because she had such a high alcohol intake, but all the potential witnesses appear to have been drinking at the same time. And there's like a lot of not direct answers. So even though it seems pretty clear from the evidence that, you know, it's more than a coincidence that you have a cracked rear light and somebody dead with those cracked rear light. Yeah, we're going to get into that Around cracked. It. I'm telling you right now, we're going to get really into that cracked taillight. This is a 124 scale of that car. We're going to get into biomechanics. Stand by for that. Catherine, <laughs> um, this, the, this guy was part of what, you know, there were more people at this party than I've ever had at one of mine, which might be a reflection on me and not their, their party. But so many witnesses, nobody sees John O'Keefe on the lawn. What's happened? Exactly. That was what I was thinking the whole time he was testifying. And in the cross-examination, the defense attorney, I, I feel, actually honed in on that very well because this witness went out of the house with three other people. So there were four of them going into their cars to go home from that party that, that morning, early morning already. And he even went back to the house and had to walk that front lawn to get something in the house and then back to his car. So, and then they drove by the location where the body would have been and none of them saw anything. 
of course, they're claiming that there was a, a, a lot of snow and the weather was really bad. Maybe that's the reason why. But then one of those people in that car later on testified that she saw a black blob, I think is, uh, don't quote me on that, but about like five. I think that's a technical term, Catherine, <laughs> uh, the blob. Yeah. Yes, uh, five to six feet on the snow, but she never said anything or raised any concern whatsoever. Yeah, that was the first time we, we'd heard about it, which was, was amazing. Okay, so Matthew McCabe also testified under direct examination that he saw the defendant's SUV on the road moving up a little bit in front of the home near the flagpole. Uh, at some point, then she just drives off. So let's listen to what he had to say when questioned by defense attorney David Yannetti. January 29th of 2022, when you spoke to Michael Proctor, you told him that you saw a black SUV parked to the right of the residence as you looked at the property from the street. Did you not? I did not. When you, can you elaborate what you mean by to the right of the residence? Well, I will just repeat the question. Did you tell Michael Proctor on January 29th of 2022 that you observed a big dark SUV parked to the right of the house? What right? Look, looking at the house to the right or looking at the house to the left? When you say right, I don't know what you mean by right. Is your memory exhausted as to what you told Michael Proctor? No, not at all. Um, so if your memory is not exhausted, would you agree with me that while you were at 34 Fairview, you told Michael Proctor that you observed a big, dark SUV parked to the right of the house? That could have been the second time I informed him of seeing the SUV. Okay. Um, if I suggested to you that that was the first time, according to what you told Michael Proctor, would you dispute that? Jackson. Sustained. Is your memory exhausted as to whether or not that was the first or second time, according to what you told Michael Proctor? My memory is not exhausted. Okay, so if your memory is not exhausted, do you deny telling Michael Proctor that you observed a big dark SUV parked to the right of the house? Jackson. Can you answer that? I, I don't know. Second question. Right. I told him I saw an SUV and parked in front of the house. Then I saw an SUV move further up the road, which looking out of the house would be to the right of the house. So that would be when I saw the SUV to the right of the house would be the second time I saw the SUV. I've always stated the SUV was in front of the house if looking out the front door. Okay, so when you talk, to, so you deny telling Michael Proctor that when you first saw the SUV, by the way, sir, is this, is this funny? I'm sorry. This is laughing. not funny, sir. Not at all. It's been two years of misery. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're, you're smiling now. That's why I ask. You keep repeating I'm, the same question. Well, I'm trying to get an answer that you won't give me, sir. Your testimony during this trial puts the SUV past the fire hydrant, almost toward the neighbor's house, correct? That is correct. But however many times you saw that black SUV, you'd agree with me, you never observed any damage to the rear of that vehicle, correct? Correct. You never saw any damage to the rear right tail light, correct? Correct. You'll also agree with me that every time you saw that black SUV, the vehicle had its headlights on, correct? I was looking as it as we talked about it moving up the property. I was looking at the back. I could see the back of the SUV. The assumption is the headlights were on, um, but I wasn't looking at the headlights. All right. Well, that would have meant that the uh, area in front of the vehicle was lit up, correct? Yes, but like I said, it was further up the road. Now, sometime after that black SUV first arrived, you noticed that there were tie tracks, tire tracks, I should say in a V shape on the street in front of the Albert home, correct? That's correct. And those tire tracks were from the curb in front of 34 Fairview toward the neighbor's property across the street and then back toward the curb, correct? Um, yes, it came out, waved out towards the, to the cross the street and came back in.
All right, learning all we need to know and maybe more about the black SUV and where it was parked and didn't do a wide turn making a V path in the snow. I don't care. I don't care about any of that. All I care about is this little, I know you can't see it very well. Let me see if I can help you out with some lights. Check this out. Okay, so in fact, this may be the Karen Reed signature model of this toy because the right taillight's a little more dim. Hmm, curious. Coincidence? I don't know. Anyway, that's the key to this case is that taillight. How do all of these witnesses testify that they saw this vehicle after the alleged bump into John O'Keefe and the taillight's still working, still there, it's still intact. The video we see right here from the O'Keefe residence where the defense alleged she backed into John O'Keefe's car causing any crack makes perfect sense. And then you hear all these, uh, these witnesses testify that the light was there and it was working uh, and, and that this all occurred hours after. By the way, that video, that ring video, four plus hours after the alleged running into of John O'Keefe. I think the prosecution either had no clue this existed or is a little bit uh, optimistic about their case. So anyway, that's this car. That's what this is about. That little tail light right there. And the question really becomes too, let's talk biomechanics. Uh, Mike, Mike, Mike Corbanix is here, Catherine Lazardo. Are you gonna run into a person with, a, with this car? What part of a person's soft tissue is gonna break a tail light? Maybe the elbow? Maybe if you're like John Cena and maybe then you can break. There's, there's just no way biomechanically that backing into a person at some relatively typical backing up speed is going to cause that kind of damage to a taillight. Might hurt the person, not to the taillight. Thoughts? My, my thoughts are that that's an excellent point you're making because you would also then want to see some, I think it's going to be very interesting. I don't know if they presented yet the medical experts as to how these injuries were caused. But like you said, I'm very surprised at the way the government is calling some of these witnesses, which I don't really feel is helping their case because it's just creating more reasonable doubt. And that's the thing. It's not whether we guess right or wrong. The government has a burden of proof to the jury to prove all the elements of this crime, uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And it seems whenever you have direct evidence witnesses taking so much time to answer a question or saying they don't understand it, that there's a question of credibility. Yeah, and I, I just, my thought is the prosecution's overreaching with this whole taillight. If you take the taillight out of the mix, you ran into the guy, and then he died because uh, he needed help. That's the story. But you throw this taillight in, I think you're, you're messed up. Okay, let's take, that's a legal term. Uh, we're going to take a break. We'll come back. More on the other side. Karen Reed, uh, case continues out of Massachusetts.